just to touch on the uh, script is written concept. We have talked about, Dr. Bob had mentioned when he was describing the script as written, he had mentioned it in the context of the uh, revelation. and It just seemed different from how you were talking about it. I was just hoping you could touch on that again a little bit. Well, revelation is, is mentioned in the early part of the text of A Course in Miracles, but that's actually most people in the world, I would say almost everyone in the world has not experienced revelation. So, um, if you're talking about revelations in the Bible, um, I don't know the exact context, but revelation itself is, is non-perceptual. It's just a direct experience of the light. So the script is written is definitely uh, talking about time. It's talking about linear time. And basically, as I've taught many, many, many times over the last two and a half decades, it's really an expression of lesson, it's just a version of lesson number seven, I see only the past. So that everything that's experienced on the timeline, all the images, all the time and space, and it's often referred to as a script, uh, even in the Book of Life, where you talk about the Akashic Records, it's usually described in terms of, of a of historical time. And the most important part of the script is written, is written, it's, it's all the past. So, when we talk about choice, there's no real choice. Human beings don't really have choice, because all the choices that seem to be part of the human experience are part of the script. And all of that is written, and all, because all of it's the past. So basically, part of the authentic spiritual journey, and this, this is not some kind of intellectual concept, this is an actual experience that you start to have a deep experience in your mind that you start to realize there's no choice in the world. And it can be very disorienting because all of the experience of being a human being is that you're making choices on the timeline between this and that, between things in the world. But there really is no choice of anything in the world. Now, that has to be arrived at as an actual experience. In other words, you, can, you could just say the words, but as long as you still seem to be struggling about things in the world, that just means that there really is no actual experience of that. You know, to actually experience the scriptures written would be a state of great peace, because it would be more like you're the dreamer of the dream and you're just watching the dream. And you realize that that's all you can really do. That you're not a participant inside of the dream, you're literally the dreamer of the dream. And that is a very high state of mind. That's what the Course calls the real world or the happy dream. And that's where there's an awareness that everything that you're perceiving is past. It's already over and done. The world was over long ago. And, and that is another line from the Course that fits in with the script is written. So it's, I would say that for those that still count the days and the hours, for those that still have had jobs and careers and go through all this interpersonal struggle around partnership and relationship and everything, the script is written has absolutely no meaning. You know, it could be like, oh, sentimentally, I read that in the Course. <laughs> but it would be almost like going to the circus and giving a, a lecture on what, what it's like to walk the high wire. You know, where you walk along the wire, the high wire in the circus, Having never walked on the high wire, you could say, well, you have to really balance, and you have to put one foot very carefully in front of the other foot. But having not actually walked across the wire, you could describe what you thought it would be, but it wouldn't be it, because it's, you actually have to go through process of, of trust, of daily miracles, of learning what Divine Providence is, and seeing that everything that you even seem to need is provided, not by, by an employee, employer, not by the government, 
uh, with a payment, not by something as the world sees it in interpersonal or personal ways, but actually you have to have a, like a full experience of divine providence. But what the script is written is meant to do is it's meant to take your mind solely on the experience of purpose in the mind, which is forgiveness. So, in other words, before you were like handling all these specific things, and you were learning to hear guidance about how do I handle this situation, how do I forgive this person, how do I handle that situation, it's very specific. But the script is written is, is a much more of a like a watching experience in the mind, where you just are aware that everything is all over and done. And um, there's even a passage in the Bible where Jesus says, there's nothing new under the sun. That's another um, passage from the Bible that's pointing at the same thing. There's nothing new under the sun. There aren't any really new ideas. There's, you know, how in marketing they always go with laundry detergent, new and improved. Mm -hmm. No, there's, because the script is written, there isn't actually a new and improved automobile or detergent. Um, human beings, they, you know, sometimes they, they go for a makeover where they can dress up different and maybe get plastic surgery and go through all these things to invent a new you. No, there's no reinvention. There's nothing new in time and space because it's all, all the images are already over and done. And even, um, there's sometimes there are metaphysical teachings that will go into create your own reality. That's not a teaching of A Course in Miracles. Uh, you, you can't create your own reality because God is the creator of reality and you can only accept reality as God <coughs> created it, which is what the whole process of waking up is. But there's no manifestation, you know, you don't see Jesus going on and on how to, how to manifest things. Because why? Because everything in the realm of linear time is already over and done. So what would it mean to manifest? When, when you're looking at the past, you can't really manifest either. So, you know, there, this is not a popular, <laughs> you can tell, this is not a popular awareness either because there's the sense of wanting to manifest new things, make heaven on earth, and make it look this way instead of that way. It's still that all is not up to the realm of the script is written. So it's a very deep teaching. And it's, you almost, I would say you have to go through the whole process of, of letting go, of trusting, of not being identified with, with anything or anyone in the world to actually come close to have that experience. But the Buddhists would say you really have to empty your mind, um, really <laughs> empty your mind to get to that teaching. Because it's, uh, that would take a lot of mindfulness in Buddhist terms to reach that point where you just see that you're just witnessing the past. So that's, that's what that is. Thank you. Okay. We've got a couple over on the left here. So. <coughs> yeah, the same question. Yeah. Actually, I'm just saying it's related. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can you then go ahead and talk about uh, a plan for awakening that each of us and how that relates to the script? That would be very helpful. Yeah, you you could say that what Jesus says is that everybody has a special function. Everybody has to play their part in the awakening. And everyone's part is essential. Now what does that even mean, part, in terms of the plan of awakening? Well, it's that when you tune into the Holy Spirit's guidance, the Holy Spirit will use the perceptual world and will give you your part, moment by moment. It's not like you get some kind of download, you know, oh you're going to be a psychic and you'll see these people and you'll do these things and you don't get like like a, a, a snapshot of what it will be. You just, you're given your part moment by moment. That's what guidance is about, is just being open to receive. When you're, when you're in that state of mind, I will step back and let him lead the way. And um, this holy instant what I give to you, be you in charge, for I would but follow 
the form that your life seems to play out in terms of the world, as you're tuned in with guidance, that's your special function. And it looks very different for everyone. That's why he says it's highly individualized. It's not going to look the same for anyone. It's just what is given you. But it will be a communication function. Not that it necessarily will have to always be verbal. It could involve smile, laughter. Mm -hmm. we, we heard the concert today, yeah. the singing. You could all feel the love just flowing so yeah. strongly. It was so deep today. And just through the, the concert, it was almost like a transmission. And I was doing a live stream over here, so there was all kinds of, of comments. Thank you, this is so precious. Oh, wow. oh my gosh, I'm at office, I'm in my cubicle at, off, at, my, at my work, <laughs> and I feel like this is God calling me out of, <laughs> out of my, my work. You know, There were some pretty profound comments coming with that transmission wow. today, because, because that was you might say that was part of the special function. Lila was saying she didn't have any thought of, of anything. It was just like when you become an, an instrument and you're used, then it just, it's like it's all happening, but, you, but there's no one inside that's in control of it. It's just, it's very involuntary. It's just a, an expression of God's love, and we all experience that. So you might say that that concert today was for those uh, uh, that were involved in it, that was part of the, the special function. That was the Holy Spirit using the form to radiate the love. And then as you continue to do that on a consistent basis, then you become less and less identified with anything of form. Everything in form starts to merge together. And you realize that there is no one doing anything. It's just the Spirit. And then as you go deeper into this experience of like a merge, where it's just the Spirit using the form, then there is no doer. And if there's no doer, then there's no guilt. Because if there's no doer, then there's no body doing anything. And the best thing to think about is even when you think of your past, that you've never done anything, you actually have never done anything wrong or right. <laughs> Which is kind of yeah, glorious. Yes. That it was the body that seemed to have the projection of, oh I did this wrong, or I shouldn't have said this, or I should have done more of that. And you see the guilt. Could have, would have, should have. The body could have, would have, should have said something different, done something different, been something more, been something less, you know, whatever. That's where the guilt comes in, is, is identifying with the body. And then putting the, the uncomfortable feeling of feeling separate from God onto the body, like putting the sins onto the body. But as I said before, uh, I think it was this recent um, online retreat I said, um, I think Nicholas posted this, uh, people are not sinners. People are learning devices. Yeah. Learning devices for your mind. That's what people are. They aren't sinners, they're just learning devices. And when you get the lesson of forgiveness, then it's like a symphony where all the, all the, whatever seemed to be said or done was just for your mind to realize its innocence. That was the whole point. And, and sins are not in bodies, because the, the ego made the bodies up. Of course the ego needs the body because it needs something to point a finger and say, wrong, bad, you know, sinner, you know, it, it's projecting all this false meaning onto the body. And as you go deeper into the miracle, you realize, I am not a body. I am free. I am still as God created me. And then the mind then re-identifies with the Spirit, or with the Christ, and that's where the innocence is. It's always been, in, the Spirit is innocent. Everybody who believes in the world of bodies, believes something's gone terribly wrong. And then it's just pointing around, oh that's wrong there, or this was wrong, or this could have been different, this could have been better. That's just the ego trying to project out this sense of guilt to the world to maintain the guilt. And then forgiveness is a way of releasing the guilt and seeing that you never really were guilty. That was just a, a hallucination, it was like a mirage, that it wasn't who you really were. Okay, Raphael. Uh, 
Thank you. Um, for those of us that feel the call to involve our children in, in the course of miracles, how, uh, how to create a space uh, in our home that is an extension of the community that now that we're connected through, through the web, it's a worldwide community. Physically, we're you not know, here in Canos or in Utah or in Mexico, but we're together. Um, why are you, why are you, what's your inspiration in that regard? Yeah, I think the, the most helpful thing anyone could do for their children, obviously, is to, to practice and to live the teachings because it's your attitude it's your attitude and your state of mind that's, that's the teacher. So you might say, when you're happy, you radiate this happiness and then those around you, including your family, are like, hmm, Raphael is really happy, happy-go-lucky, light-hearted, not, uh, not critical, condemning, you know, as you go into that state of mind and that attitude, that's going to be the biggest struggle. Because it's not so much what you do, but it's the attitude that you ex consistently radiate that's going to be the teacher. The attitude will be the teacher. And then, as you uh, begin to move forward with this, if others come along and others are curious, or they have questions, or they have ideas, like maybe, wow, maybe things don't have to be the same way that they were. You can have all kinds of new, like ever free-flowing ideas that come in and, and therefore your family is more like an opportunity for the extension of ideas. And also there's a lot of allowance and permission. You know, we, we pray together, you know, they always say the family that prays together stays together. We stay in a very prayerful state where ideas are welcome. So we oftentimes, someone will say, I have an idea. Somebody else will say, I have an idea. And there's a free allowance for the flow of ideas without trying to make ideas right or wrong, without trying to, to think um, that we have to know what the guidance is. A lot of times with a free flow of ideas and then there's a prayerful state of openness, then there'll be certain things that will just emerge from that allowance and from that openness. And, and then you can live a very inspired life, so you don't need those rules and rituals and all the things that most families, most businesses, most churches, most societies are filled with a lot of, of rules and rituals and regulations. But as you you're in that attitude and you have such a free flow of ideas, then it can be like a spontaneous flow. The fountain is just flowing and flowing. And you don't even think that a day has to, has to go a certain way. You know, it's fun, it could be a fun thing for you and your family to say, let's watch how the day unfolds. We're going to have a wonderful day. We don't know necessarily how that's going to look, but we don't really need to know necessarily how that's going to look. And then everybody's enjoying it as it's unfolding, you know, moment by moment. But um, I, I feel like um, we certainly want to encourage everyone to, to live a very guided, joyful, spontaneous life where they're the creative flow from within is just pouring through and there's a lot of joy and there's a lot of vitality and, and there's a lot of happiness that's included in that. And it's not about trying to uh, make the form be a certain way. And uh, so it, we just encourage that, we, we enjoy that. I mean, I, <clears throat> I have a, a woman I've been counseling recently who uh, she has three small children, and one baby actually in the thing, and her, her husband abruptly left her, wants nothing to do with her, um, and she just went through all these emotions of betrayal and abandonment, and you've just left me with three young children, and this and this, and she's watching a lot of my YouTubes and listening to the speakers, and she's like, 
we have very interesting counseling calls because she's got three children around her that need her and, and the temptation for her egoically is to want to blame her husband for just leaving the scene and abandonly, abandoning entirely and what we focus on more is, okay, here's an opportunity for nurturing. You have an enormous opportunity but you really have to be guided to stay focused on the nurturing because the temptation to want to blame, point the finger, uh, think something went terribly wrong does rise up quite often and he's really wanted no communication. Occasionally he'll call in just to talk to the kids, not to her and he won't call her by her affectionate nickname anymore, just her her first name and it's very kind of cold and sterile and stoic and we just focus on okay, what's the lesson here? It's, it's about nurturing, it's about loving and radiating, it's about being very clear in your own mind of not looking outside yourself for any kind of dependencies or any kind of um, reliances and coming clear and strong into the Holy Spirit. And that's what this whole situation is for, is just to tune in in a very strong way with the Holy Spirit. So we have had joyful, joyful, we just had a joyful call the other night and uh, she said, okay, the baby's in the crib, the kids have got the popcorn, they're watching a movie, <laughs> time to talk to them. <laughs> and we're talking and all of a sudden there's a knock at the door, it's the little, little ones come, mommy, mommy, mommy let me in. So she goes to the door, who are you talking to? Who is that man? Is it the man from the petrol station? No. It's the miracle man. It's the I am entitled to miracles man. Remember from the videos? And so then she, the little, the little girl gets included in on the conversation, but a lot of it's been like <clears throat> emotions coming up. Like she'll be out with the kids and the kids will be like, I miss daddy or I remember when daddy used to do this or I remember when daddy used to do that and then the tears start rolling down her face and she says, is it okay to cry in front of the children? Yes, the children have to see this, you have to be authentic, you've got nothing to hide here, you've got to let all those emotions come up and then if they ask questions, then use all that. Let the Holy Spirit put the words in your mouth, you know, use that and teach the strength of, of the Holy Spirit, teach your reliance on the Holy Spirit, teach that you're entitled to miracles you know, let, use that as your teaching opportunity, teach what you would learn. Because it seems to be kind of an extreme case, but really every single situation is an opportunity for us to, to strengthen in the Holy Spirit, regardless of what the circumstances are. So that's the practicality of, in her case, she's got her family around and she's got a very strong, she's, she even was saying, it's hard for me to have time during the day to even do my workbook lesson because it's like she feels like she's just in a swirl of things to do and she's got to be really focused, like a razor sharp focus to make it through the day from early in the morning till at night when the kids are all put to bed. It's like a full on curriculum of, of, of what seems to be a very extreme life because how young the they are. And and also she's in a country far, far away uh, from from where her family is, so there's, there's, yeah, she's over there, she's over there, she asking me if I have, know any course friends and, you know, but, but there's no family support, so she, it's like a really full-on curriculum, but, but still it's the same curriculum that all of us have. And, and I know for a lot of you coming over even to the mystery school, coming out to the desert, most of you don't live <laughs> in the desert. This is in some ways a bit extreme as well. You know, you're coming out and you're out in the, in the high desert. <laughs> That's it, right? It's, so you're kind of like her in a, a situation like, oh, I've got to deal with these emotions and I've get, got to deal with a lot of things here and, and there is a purpose behind everything. So, thank you. Thank you, Raphael. Yeah. Yes. When we arrived, we um, 
we had hugs with a number of people and um, you were at the end of the line and the hug I had with you, I um, felt intimidated. And even though I speak with some nervousness at the moment, I'm no longer intimidated by you. Good. <laughs> okay. I recognised when I felt that fear and intimidation, um, I quickly realised it was my own doing, my own thoughts. But um, the process of forgiveness of my own thoughts and feelings and learning a lesson takes time What would you say would be the quickest way of making that shift between intimidation and peace? Well, that, I would say that's the value of, um, of the expression sessions. And, and what you're doing right now is a, is a perfect example of that. Because what we keep bobbled up, or what we keep hidden, is we hold on to it that way. That's how we keep it. And as we expose, um, it's, it's, uh, that's something that uh, Bob Rosenthal and I talked about, is that the, the key to healing is exposure. Because mm -hmm. wherever that fear is, that intimidation, it's, it's coming from the unconscious mind. And the unconscious mind, Jesus called at one point, he called it the unwatched mind. So imagine that you, you're aware of your conscious thoughts, mm -hmm. and you're aware of the surface of your mind, but the unwatched mind is the unconscious mind. And that's where it's, it's just a lot of beliefs. Beliefs about time and space, beliefs about identity, beliefs about many things that are kept away from the conscious mind and they're buried. So, so, when you think of them consciously is one thing, when you aren't thinking of them consciously but they're still having an impact, mm -hmm. is there, I'll call them assumptions. When we live a life of assumptions, then we're really at the mercy of this unconscious mind. And so, even you speaking up about this is is your permission and your allowance to say, I don't want this to be hidden anymore, because hiding it is how I keep it buried, and, and how I, I'm, I'm literally held by it, I'm, I'm held back by what is unconscious. So for us, that's why we have such an emphasis on expression sessions, we have such an emphasis on, on Say what you're feeling, expose it, express it, and um, I know even with um, celebrities, I know I, I heard of a recent um, talk where uh, it was um, it was Robert Redford, Robert Redford's doing his last movie, and I think Sissy Spacek is is playing the the female part opposite him, and and she said I believe years ago. I think it was her, when, when she first met him, um, she combined his first name and his last name when she greeted him into one word. Just part of his last name and part of his first name. And then she felt so embarrassed, but she was so nervous at meeting Robert Redford that she had some variation. Robert. Robford or something like that, and, and then she was like, and she felt so guilty and shameful about that for years. Now she's in this motion picture with him, and she brought it up, and, and she said, I have to expose this, and he didn't even recall the event. <laughs> and she's been <laughs> rehashing that event for all these years because she felt a sense of shame or embarrassment around it. And then as soon as she, I'm sure as soon as she exposed it to him, and he went, Oh, I don't even remember that. Probably gave her a hug or something. That's the release. So she, maybe she was a bit intimidated by Robert Redford. He was such a, a, a movie star. But whatever it is, there's some kind of a, 
a value or there's some kind of a meaning, false meaning that's been given to something, and once you expose it, then it, it's the fast track at letting it go. Um, Lisa mentioned that uh, one of the themes of the Mystery School this time uh, seems to be about bodies. So, of course, I have a body question. Well, not about my body, but other bodies. The other bodies being animals that we eat. Um, they have a mind. I believe that if it has a mind, it's part of the mind of God. So, my question is, one, why do we eat animals? Um, why do we eat animals if they have a, uh, if they're, I believe they have a mind maybe the course doesn't, I don't know maybe give a bit of clarity on that or if it's all an illusion or there's no hierarchy of illusions why don't we eat people <laughs> 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 What bunk room are you in? <laughs> they were concerned about uh, maybe mice or mosquitoes. <laughs> well, you know, everything about this world, including the, the thing we could say, the diets and so forth of, of human beings, is all learned. So it's all just habit, it's all ritual. Uh, there are some that, that basically question that ritual and maybe they become vegetarians in their mind. They shift their dietary habits or maybe they become microbiotic or eventually maybe they, they, they kind of outgrow the whole ritual of eating bodies and they become breatharians. <laughs> they, they really transcend the whole whole thing, but it's it's just uh, it's just rituals and habits, and um, so there is a belief in lack, and there's this belief in uh, hunger and sustenance, and so on and so forth. And then um, there are many different cultures that have many different dietary habits and, and eating rituals. You can see huge variations. Uh, if you look at different cultures, I mean, there's some cultures that have such a value for animal bodies that they will actually, as they walk through the forest, they will have someone leading the way, sweeping the path to make sure that they get all the the insects off the path so they don't even step <laughs> on the insects. You know, it's it's quite, that's quite a lot of care and attention to have, have a sweeper leading your uh, walk because of that care and attention, but ultimately it's, it's all just learned. And then you might say as you begin to become more into the miracle, more into what the East would call pranic, the pranic energy, then the whole ritual starts to dissolve. And that's why even in the Bible, the apostles would be quite concerned after watching Jesus teaching in the desert there for two or three days and he hasn't eaten anything. Lord, you have to eat something. He would say, ah, I, have, I have manna, manna from heaven, I have manna from above. That was, he was just talking, he has unlearned the, the ritual. Not to say that he wouldn't break bread with the apostles, you know, again that's more of just a, um, I think he was aware that that whatever seemed to be the rituals of the human being, that he had a, a message to deliver, a very profound message of innocence and, and love, and even for him, if he never was eating a fish or never eating bread, uh, he might have, they might have thought he was a bit like an alien, like he had come from another planet, because that's such a common ritual on earth, that if he had never drank wine or broken bread or whatever, it would have, he might have been a, a strange, the body would have been a strange teaching device if it could have been seen as it's different from every other body. So, so even with that, there's, it's all what will serve the, the overall mission, not whether 
it's right or wrong moralistically to eat eat a fish or to eat or drink, but it's just what serves the the plan. So that gives you like a context. You can start to just say, hmm, I, I don't need to be so concerned about those things because it is just a projection of of learning. And I, my goal is to unlearn everything about the whole ego system and then be inspired. Let the Holy Spirit be, guide you in what to say, where to go, what to do, what to eat, what to not eat, you know. Well, I did take your advice in the book of the Holy Spirit saying, eat the dinner, so I do. But um, if, I was off, oh, sorry. if I was offered food with meat, in it, I would not refuse it. I would, of course, eat it. But it's, I suppose it's going back to preferences in it. I would prefer not to eat meat, but I would eat it if it was, if somebody went to the effort of making me a, a meal and was, I, of course I would eat it, but no, I was just wanted to know what the, um, I still don't eat meat, I don't feel guided to eat it yet, but um, that's not ruling it out. Yeah. 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 That, the, the rule of thumb is you're wanting to join and connect, yeah. Yeah. and that's when I traveled around a lot, people would, that was a way of their showing love. They would say, I could tell they were offering, you know, please come and eat with us. And it was like, there was a sense of, I, I love you, please be with our family. It was an honoring. Yeah. And that's when Jesus was saying, yeah, you have to really join with that sense of love and honoring, because that's the, that's the whole message right there. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not what goes in the mouth that defiles. He was talking about, it's what, what's coming from your heart, where you have to pay attention. and. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. So, yeah, I think you're on the right track mm -hmm. with that okay, whole thank thing. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, David. Hi. Um, uh, regarding Jesus, and he actually was here walking the planet, walking the earth, was he, uh, I know that Jesus is a brother, but there was prophecy saying that he was coming. Was he ordained in any way as being the one that was going to, or was he just another person just like the rest of us, a brother? And he happened to decide to do the work and awaken. Yeah, it, there was a, a lot of prophecy, even um, back into the Old Testament, talking about the Messiah, when the Messiah comes. And then the whole story about the three wise men mm -hmm. And following the star, mm-hmm. And this little baby being born in a manger, mm-hmm. And this was prophesied. In other words, the script is written, and in this script, there would be a baby born that was destined to, to be the one, in the sense that it's the first one to accept the atonement. And that's really what Messiah is, because the atonement is complete innocence. That's, that's what your Messiah is. One who demonstrates complete innocence, complete gentleness, complete love, complete I and the Father are one. You know, seeing there's no separation in spirit between the Creator and the creation. And so that was prophesied and that's why when, you know, even if you watch those Jesus of Nazareth movies and everything, you can feel this swirl like, oh, there was something significant there. Not that there was anything more special about the body of Jesus than any other body, but it's just that, that the mind gave itself over to the Holy Spirit. So at some point when the resurrection occurred, which is really um, the complete connection with God, uh, and he, that's before he went on his public ministry and called the Apostles, uh, I kind of think of it back to the time, I don't know if you remember the River Jordan, when he's, he's getting baptized by John the Baptist, and the dove yeah. comes down, and then the, the voice from heaven, This is my beloved son, in yeah. whom I'm well pleased. You know, there's something <laughs> going on there that's not typical. <laughs> if you look back at human history, like, this is not typical. And that was before the public mission. Then he goes around teaching, before Abraham was, I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's not a human being. You know, we would be suspicious if a human being said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. We'd be like, 
Yeah. yeah. What's your credentials? And uh, by what authority? That's what the scribes and the Pharisees were like. By what authority do you say these things? And he was always pointing to God. Why do you call me good? God is good. You know, if you've seen the Father, if you've seen the Son, you know, these these teachings were just, it was a demonstration of the love of God on planet Earth, uh, which was just an all-inclusive love. There was no sense of separation in there. And I would say it's the destiny for everyone to to hear only one voice, as Jesus did. And, and Jesus is, portrays himself as an equal brother, equal with all of us, mm -hmm. not ahead. Oh, only in the sense of time, you know, he says, because he's accepted the atonement, um, he's like in between mankind and God. He's kind of the bridge now. And, and without him, he says, the, the gulf or the gap, the distance would be so great. So literally, he, he inspires miracles. He, he's, you might say, pulling down the love of God to a place where it can be spoken and and uh, comprehended by human beings, that they can aspire to be like the mind that is Christ Jesus, you know. So he's like the bridge, is the Holy Spirit is, is the bridge. And Jesus is, you might be think of as synonymous with the Holy Spirit, um, or it was like a puppet that the Holy Spirit used to demonstrate the love of God in using words, in using forms. And uh, the, those kind of prophecies, yeah, those, this serve a purpose too. Like, it's, it was like, it's coming. And then, now, it came. <laughs> and we're, with the Course in Miracles, it's almost like that's our, our modern day, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's something that we, we all really have a deep honoring of and a resonance of, because we feel that presence pouring through you know, those books, for us, for all of us to accept our part. Yeah. It was prophesied that he'd be back, and I called the feeling he's back now. Yeah, here, here with, amongst us, yeah, we can really feel it. Because sure. people would say to me, they'd say, you know, who is your teacher, and who is your guru? And I'd say, Jesus. Yeah. And they'd say, well, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. but he's yeah. been dead for two of us. Well, no, he isn't. No, <laughs> I, you know, when he's speaking to you in conversational terms, when he's guiding you, loving you, directing you, you know, it's an actual experience. And so, you know, I've, I spoke at a conference um, two or three years ago over in Colorado, and I, I did the whole talk on, yeah, Jesus is my teacher. And then you, you more and more merge with that, with that presence, so that it's, you start to feel more and more that it's not a presence that's different from who you are. Yeah, and close. isn't so that, close. yeah, it's that close. It's so close that you start to feel like, oh my gosh, that's what the Christ presence is all about. And that's my identity as well. So mm -hmm. that's what the whole awakening is about. You might say that the second coming is accepting yourself yeah. as the Christ, not looking for a man to come down with a white horse and, you know, come, it's cloudy today. Wait, what? Yeah. It's Jesus! <laughs> you, know, it's like, you don't have to, like, wait for him coming down. And, Did you cut your hair? <laughs> you know, you don't have to, it's, it's just the presence of Christ in you is the second coming of Christ. And that's what we're all about here, is to accept ourselves as the Christ. Yeah. Yeah. So it's time up. I don't know if we want to do a break before we move here. One more question. We can keep going. Uh, yeah. If there's anybody else? Hello, David. Hi. Hi. I have a question. You are saying by exposing. The darkness will dissolve, will dissolve. But I have this really vicious monster within myself. It's really, it's not like a minor annoyance or like something I feel comfortable expressing. It's really 
angry and it's like it's a really huge deep hatred and rage and this kind this kind of feeling I can feel that this will push the button to launch the nuclear bomb and just laugh at those cities being destroyed and everything and uh, like like mass murder is like possible by this anger and will probably even enjoy it. I really want this anger to be hidden. And if I, I feel like if I express it, I have to kill myself. It's just like no way I'll live like in front of those people. And I'm afraid to be judged. And uh, so it's still really always hidden. And I don't know how, what to do with this. So I was like wondering if you could. Um, yeah, yeah. Talk. I could address that. I mean, there's a part of the course that, that really um, I could really relate to, and, and it's where Jesus says, until you are willing to be in touch with the full extent of your own self-hatred. You will not be willing to let it go. And I know for myself and then the communities I've lived in over the years and working with the Course, you know, that, that rage, that anger, it, it has to come up, it has to be exposed, and there has to be a context for that to happen. And um, we use movies, for example. I, re I know there's, there's even some music that I was guided to listen to that helped me start to really get into touch with the full extent uh, of that, that rage and that anger. Also, in the context of relationships, you know, that's... A lot of times people will experience uh, a bit of that monster in interpersonal relationships and it's just shocking, you know. It's absolutely shocking when that, that when the shadow comes up. There was a Billy Joel song years ago called The Stranger uh, where <clears throat> he talks about the stranger coming up and and uh, and then he sings the chorus, don't be afraid to try again everyone goes sour every now and then. You've done it, why can't someone else? You should know by now, you've been there yourself. So, it, it's like I would say, um, even most interpersonal relationships are not really built for that monster. I mean, that monster has been the source of many divorces and many separations. They may go gliding along for a while, but when the monster shows up, it's almost like, who are you? I can't even believe that I'm in a relationship with you, or I can't believe I'm married to you, or I'm going to get an attorney immediately, you know, because it's, because the, that level of anger and rage is just absolutely astounding and shocking. And then I would say, uh, we have movies in our collection like, um, I think Dark City is a is a movie. I remember when this movie uh, was filmed in Australia, but when this movie Dark City came out, um, I had a friend, a roommate um, at the time, who said, let's go see this movie. He said, come on David, I'm taking you to see this movie. And we went to see this movie Dark City, and it had so much of A Course in Miracles in the movie, but these characters were like vicious. They were just like murdering characters, all dark, and they had the funny thing that happened with their, their mouths and their teeth chattering, and, and it was quite a, an amazing movie. I think there was maybe four people uh, in the theater besides my friend and I, and, and during the movie they would, we would all kind of look at each other in the movie theater like, are you going to hang in with this one? But actually, my friend and I, we were in the back Road doing like high fives, <laughs> like whoa! We were <laughs> high five, and then the rest of the people in the movie theater were like looking at back, like, "What movie are you watching?" Because <laughs> it was 
There was so much Course in Miracles in the movie, we were high-fiving like every five or ten minutes. But it was like a, seeing like a, a horror movie, like a Hitchcock kind of movie, but we were seeing a lot more. So, so we do use a lot of movies, and we have watched uh, uh, a lot of movies. What was that movie with um, the guy who was a musician, a drummer, and... Oh, Whiplash. Whiplash. Oh, yeah, we watched, Whiplash brought up a lot. There's a, there's a lot of movies that's almost like the Spirit brings them into us to help clear out the monster. And so that is one way that I think I and the community have, have used. We've used um, a lot of movies. That, that's like a context for it, um, for releasing that, because you're, you're watching it and the monster does come up you know, it, during these movies and then there's more of a context for being carried through those. It's not typical. Um, and um, and also relationships. I mean, I think that's that's a part of guided relationships where where um, there can. I remember when I went to China for the first time, and uh, um, Francis and I were there, and Jason was there, and um, they decided to. Uh, we went down. We first were up in. Uh, in Beijing, and then we went down to Shanghai, and they would bring people up. I think Jason would go around and look in the audience and find somebody and call them out of the audience and and uh, bring them up. And I remember he called on this one woman uh, who who I've stayed in touch with uh, over the years, and her name was Susie. And she came up, and we sat down and looked across each other. Kind of like Gangaji, a little bit like the hot seat and this and this and this. She just raged at me. She got down in that chair and she just screamed at the <laughs> top of her lungs. Just screamed and screamed and screamed. And I remember looking over at Jason. And we were like, Thank you. And, and Jason was just like shaking his head later. He was like, well, I had to pick a screamer. And the whole audience. I had to pick a screamer, but she just absolutely let the, the monster up, and uh, and it was very healing for her. She just raged and raged and raged and raged, and I just loved her and loved her and loved her and loved her, and there was something there, fits to that expression thing about exposing. She exposed the monster right in front of me, right in front of everybody, and, and then... Um, I gave her a big long hug and then she showed up, um, as I would go back to China, there she was again and again, and of all the people I think that I know, that I've interacted with in China, she's the one that, that we Skype, <laughs> we still, the screamer is the one that <laughs> turned into like the long term uh, relationship. It, it started off with the monster and with the rage, but it, we've maintained uh, contact. Uh, even when she's been off like traveling uh, with just trusting and learning to tune in more to the Holy Spirit and she's really gone on the journey in a very deep way. And she's kind of like an Indian sannyasi. She's just gone and she's traveled and she's trusted the Holy Spirit. But it all started with the rage. So that gives you like a context, like the Spirit knows that, that monster is in there and knows that that monster has to come up and has to be released and will bring in the opportunities. And uh, so, so I would just say from all that, just take heart to know that, yeah, it's not like an impossible uh, situation. There will be what you need to release that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think we need to just move the chairs around for our movie, yep. and so just a couple minutes and we'll... Can we take just a quick tea break? Yeah, you can take a little potty break right now if you need to, and uh, we'll resume with the movie very shortly. Yeah.